stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against powers, against world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, taking up the shield of faith, which you will be able to distinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And by verse 17, he says and what he means by that, and go to war. The last two things you picked up was the helmet and the sword, and you marched off to combat. So that makes a kind of an interesting story here. What's really, in, what's really neat about this, that this whole thing is laid out with five imperatives. There are five imperatives. Um, Jane, as a proofreader, uh, wanted to be sure that I meant angels and not angles. In the second paragraph, Satan led one-third of the angles. So that should be angels. Well, let's open with a word of prayer, and we'll get into this discussion here tonight on how to win in the Anzac angelic conflict every time William says always every time would you say William every time always all the time and every, time. every time all the time okay the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living you can't study it nor can you apply it in carnality evidence of carnality is personal sin it could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue or overt sins they should be confessed in silence and privacy through your priesthood of 1 Peter 2. The confession comes through 1 John 1, 9, which instructs us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. That cleanses, restores us to fellowship of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit, essential for Bible study, essential for application of the word of God to your life. I mean, last two things to pick up when you march off to war is the helmet, the helmet and the word of God, the sword. And so, our Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way to study with us by automobile and by Internet. We pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister to their lives because they've gone through the protocol to proper Bible study. They have made confession of sin. They've examined their life. They've examined their relationship with you and uh, have confessed sin if necessary and otherwise they've gone into the prayer and prayed that God would teach us some great things tonight about how to win always every time every time always in the angelic conflict we are warriors we are warriors we've been called to be warriors we've been called to be many things and one of them in the angelic conflict is to be warriors. We are soldiers. And so I pray, Father, in the angelic conflict, we would be that. He made it very clear to us that our warfare is not with flesh and blood. It is in the unseen, invisible dimension that only spiritual eyes can see and understand and win in. And we can win every time, always. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been in a, a study on the angelic conflict. And one of the reasons this is because people are always wondering, if God is sovereign, then why did he allow man to sin and this whole mess start? I mean, why the human race business? And why are we in such a mess? And why do we need to be saved if perfect God created this? Why didn't he just leave it alone? And the answer is the angelic conflict that occurred in eternity past. My second paragraph. 
In my first paragraph, I introduced my study, the human race was created originally and still, created in the image according to the likeness of God, but inferior to angels. That We read that in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. You see in your paper Guam, and, and notice it's a Guam with a, with a comma and a U and a comma and an A and a comma and, the man, and then M. And what that stands for is the order of creation. The G stands for God, who is supreme. And the U stands for the universe, the universe that was created. And uh, the A stands for angels and the M stands for man. Okay. Now, there are some theologians that disagree with this order. Okay. They, they think that the, the A and the U should be swapped. Okay. They think the A and the U should be swapped. The reason that many of us, and, and so theologians are divided on that, it doesn't, I don't really care as long as God's number one. The rest of the order, will, <laughs> I don't really care. I'm not going to sit around and fuss over that. But some believe God created, then the angels, then the universe, and then man. But the reason they use the universe is because they think the earth, the earth is only part of it. <laughs> The earth, I mean, when you look at the bigger scale of everything, and people have known this for ions, that earth is just one small part, isn't it, of the universe. And so for most of us, we think that the earth was, was brought out of that universe and became an important part. And so we think that God created the universe, then he created angels, and in that midst, then earth became an issue with man. I mean, uh, where did God put man? He put him on earth. Now, he could put him a lot of places, apparently. I mean, as much as we know about the universe, we still know nothing. <laughs> we know quite a bit about our galaxy, but, you know, I mean, that, that's a pretty big place out there. And listen, when you get to heaven, you have a bird's eye view. You will see as nobody's ever seen it because you'll see it from the other side. See, when we look, we only see this side of it, but from heaven you'll see the whole thing. You'll see the whole thing. You'll see the other side of the universe. Nobody's seen that. And that's kind of amazing to me. And so for guys like me, I stay with the old tradition of Guam. I believe God, universe, angels, and man. Now that's the order. Therefore, you see, when... When Psalms, the writer, we talked about this last week, when Psalms, the 8th chapter, verse 5 comes in, then this order of Guam makes sense to us. So, what is the deal here? Well, Satan led a third of the angels, according to the scriptures, in rebellion against God and his plan of eternity past. We talked about that because we're, we're now deep into this subject matter in our study of the angelic conflict. We studied Isaiah 14. We studied Ezekiel 28. We will visit Hebrews 12. We looked at, looked at that, but we will visit that again. Hebrews 12, chapter 1 through 9. And as a result, they were cast out of the third heaven, the other side of the universe, um, to earth. And a really interesting passage to me, and one that you should read on your own and be prepared later to take a good look at that, is Luke, the 10th chapter, 18 through 20, when the disciples come back, and you ought to pay attention to what Jesus said is a bigger deal than all the things you think about. They were surprised that they could go out and heal and cast out demons and do unbelievable things in the name of Jesus Christ. And he, he says, if you think that's a big deal, that ain't nothing compared to having your name written in the book of life. <laughs> I love that. If you think all that's big, nothing's bigger than having your name written in the book of life. And he said, you guys missed the point. Of that. I sent you out on, a, on an evangelism missionary trip, and you missed the point. <laughs> the idea wasn't to see the, the miracles that come through the name of Christ, but see the people who believe for salvation and have their names secured in the Lamb's Book of Life. 
And that's the name of the game, people. No matter what all this other stuff is, that's what's important. You pass through this life, the most important thing you can do with somebody is give them a clear gospel and bring them into the kingdom and see the, the angels or at least imagine the angels celebrating with you in somebody being saved. I don't think there's anything more important in our whole work than that. Listen to me, and I'll tell you why. Because nothing was more important to Jesus than that. Right? <laughs> yeah, come on in. So here we are in the very beginning. We're looking at Psalms 8.5. In the Hebrew, it says this, and we start, we've studied this. But it says, you have made him a lo little lower than God. And our, I told you that's exactly what it says in the Hebrew. Remember that, Elohim? And crowned him with glory and majesty. Well, you say, where did Hebrews 2.8 or 2.7, how, how did they translate that? Angels, well, they did it out of the Septuagint. And, and you could rightly do that. You could rightly do that. Um, let me give you an example of Old Testament thinking about angels. When in Job 1 and 2, when Satan comes before the, the heaven council and, and Job becomes the issue, do you know who, you know who was called to assembly? Yeah, but you know what they were called? You know what that whole council, you know what they were called? They were called sons of God. You know who he's talking about? He's talking about the elect angels. They were called sons of God. And that's all over the book of Job. Job, the first chapter, second chapter, and 38. <clears throat> so, but I think for most of us, is the order. God is supreme, creator of the universe, creator of angels, creator of man. That's the main point. Whatever order you want to put them in, I don't care. Just have an order, <laughs> some sort. Uh, and so when James comes along, uh, uh, when Hebrew, the writer of Hebrew comes along, they, they're quoting from the Septuagint, which was their Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, which was the Bible of their day, kind of like King James and New American Standard and I, that type of thing. I mean, but they only had, this was the deal. And so for the, 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 the Jews uh, who were in dispersion, this was their Bible. Most of them, most of them spoke, spoke Greek. They were fluent in Greek and not in Hebrew. Uh, many of them, only those who had a good understanding of Hebrew, was they had a synagogue. They didn't have a synagogue, and the key role of a, of a rabbi was to, was to teach them the language and the scriptures. We had to teach the language before you teach scriptures. We know that if you go to, if you go to our, our school, if you get to learn Greek. But, but anyhow, and so there, when he quotes, he says, but you have made him a little lower than the angels. That's the identical. It's, it's, taken, it's taken identically out of the Septuagint. Uh, you see the word 70 on there? Roman numeral 70. That stands for Septuagint. Sometimes you will see that, and they mean Septuagint by that. Um, so I want to look at two things tonight uh, in the angelic conflict, winning in the angelic conflict. Uh, the first thing is the, the Paul introduces us as new covenant believers, so I want to talk about that part of it, about how this thing works. I mean, win every time. In the angelic conflict. And, and listen, this is the major deal in your Christian life. This is the thing you battle every day, whether you know it or not. And, and here's, how, here's how Paul lays that out. Now, this is really important. And so I'm going to lay it out the way he laid it out. He laid it out with five imperatives. That's a command. That's a, a command in the Greek language. The imperative. It is in English, too. But it, it, it's a command. In our lesson text, Paul gives six key spiritual weapons of warfare for winning the angelic conflict. There are six key spiritual weapons of warfare for winning in the angelic conflict. 
Now, do you think that might be important to know what those six doctrines are? There's six doctrines. They're called spiritual weapons. And you know why we call them? Because, listen, you have to know them. You have to be trained by them. You have to be trained by them to be acquainted with them and the importance of them in warfare. If you ever went to the military, you know just what I said. Everybody goes through basic training no matter what you wind up being. Uh, because at some point you're trained, you're, tra you're trained, and then if you specialize in something other than infantry, then they send you on to other schools uh, to specialize it. But everybody's trained to pick up a weapon, use it, kill the enemy if necessary. And how good was that uh, for training? So these are these are key weapons in it. But you, you listen, it's not enough just to memorize the names. You have to understand how they operate. Right? These are six weapons that are key to, to infantry warfare. And, and the illustration Paul's going to make with a Roman soldier is infantry. Of course, they didn't have planes back then, but or tanks, I guess, but they had similar things. Some used elephants rather than tanks, didn't they, in warfare? Well, anyhow, it doesn't matter. Uh, he listed the Roman infantry types of weapons Five, listen to me, I find this really interesting. Five in defense, one in offense. Five in, listen, what does that say to you? Five, five pieces of armor for defense and one for offense. What's that tell you? Well, it tells you that, but five to one, is that, that's, that's quite a ratio, don't you think? So what's that tell you? What? Yeah, right? I mean, you're going to get hit a lot. Right? I mean, you're going to hit a lot. I mean, five to one, I'd take those odds any day. Right? Five to one? It just tells you something about the angelic conflict. How gigantic it is, how intense it is. You're going to hit five times to one. And listen, you'll get, hit, you, you'll get hit, hit five times before you have a chance, probably, to use your offensive weapon. And these things, five are for defense and one's for offense. Only one for offense. Think about that. That's got to be a powerful idea. And what is that one? Word the Word of God. It amazes me that the... Church is not full of people that would want to know how to win an angelic conflict when they're being hit every day five to one. And listen, they're usually casually if they don't know the one. Think if they don't have the offensive weapon, they're a dead duck. See what I mean? I don't know if there's a duck unit. I just created a duck unit. And amphibians. Uh, but anyhow... Uh, five commands. So I want to lay this out in the five commands. Verse 10 is a command. 11 and 12 is a command. 13 is a command. 14, 16 is a command. And 17 is a command. You got that? No? So I wrote it out for you. Right? I laid this thing out for you so you can see it. So here's what I did. Warrior enlisted or volunteer, the warrior. Listen to what he says in verse 10. And he starts with that. He doesn't close with it. So how important is training and preparation for the warfare? Here's what he says. Be strong. That's, now listen, do you see, do you see the, ver, the Greek? Look, it's a, now I'm going to tell you this. It's a present passive imperative, second person plural. Now, I want you to stop for a minute. Go down to the second one where it says warfare enemy. See the imperative? It's an aorist. That's A stands for aorist. Are you with me? Go down to war mentality. Aorist active imperative. See that? You know, hum or something. Okay. All right. So I'm one, two, three, uh, 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 the war enemy. I meant war enemy. See, that's an heiress, war enemy. War mentality, notice that's an heiress. 
weapons for fighting. You see that at the very bottom? That's an heiress. Turn your paper. Warrior going to war. What is that? It's an heiress. Now pay attention. Pay attention to this. There's only one out of these imperatives that's a present tense. And it's a passive voice. Now, we got some middles in there, but this is a, pa this is a present tense. Which means this is a standing command. You must always be here. In verse 10, be strong all the time. Be strong where? Not in your will, but in the Lord. Be strong where? In the Lord. And how, how often? All the, time. All the time. There's no break in this. If you are, if you do, listen, a weak soldier is not going to make heavy combat. Weak soldier is not going to make it. You got to be a strong, you got to be a strong soldier to fight a tough war. And we're in a tough war because we're getting hit five to one. He tells you going in. That's the odds. We're in what's called the intensity of the angelic conflict. The church is because we're in the last days of human history. Jesus came in the last days, the consummation of the ages. Now, if you come to my Tuesday night and Wednesday night Bible studies, you know this stuff I'm telling you. Be strong in the Lord. It's the only present tense. It tells you how important it is to be a strong soldier every day, all the time, always be prepared. It's not, listen, here's what, here's the idea. Inhale, exhale of the word of God. That's how you come strong. Inhale, exhale. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. All scriptures inspired by God, right? Right? All inspired by God. All, God breathed, God breathed. All scripture is God breathed. Inhale, exhale. And then profitable, right? For your life. So here's one of those abs. So be strong in the Lord. Now watch. That's the first part. Where, where should your strength come from? Where does your strength come from? Lord. It's the only place it can come for, and you can win in the angelic conflict. If that strength comes from any place else, you will not win in the angelic conflict. Because we're inferior to that conflict. Apart from Jesus Christ, we are inferior, not superior. In Christ, we are superior. Our position in Christ, we talked about it, uh, what, Tuesday night, last, last night, positional sanctification. Be strong in the Lord. Now watch this. And, that's an adjunctive, and you got to be strong in the Lord. you got to know that all of your strength and ability comes from the Lord and not from you. And the second thing you must know, and in the strength of his might. So when you get fatigued, when you get mentally down, when you, get to, when you start getting rattled, wh wh what are you going to do? Listen, you rely on the strength of his might, the strength. Listen, get those two words. You don't need those two words together. One of the, either one of those words is sufficient, is it not? His strength. But listen, he says, in his strength, listen, when you, when you feel, I just can't go anymore. I can't take it. I'm done. I'm through with this. That's because you're looking at yourself, have to deliver yourself from whatever he messes in. You think, you think oh, I got I to gotta work my way out of this. I got to figure a way out. Listen, be strong in the Lord. Secondly, in the strength of his might. You know how you know what I mean? When when you say, I don't have the strength, listen, he will give you the might. You know how much powerful that is? I don't think I can lift it. And all of a sudden you could lift three times as much. People say, Well, that's adrenaline. We don't. We say that's the Lord. You know, you, you hear where Somebody's caught under a car and some little weak person comes out and just lifts it up. And they're like, how'd that happen? Well, even the person that did don't know. He don't why. I just went into another dimension. Who knows? You know, we have all scientific terms for it. 
But listen, we have that kind of access every day, all the time, in the present tense in our life. Why would you let? You're being hit. Why would you get down? Why would you go like, I don't know. <laughs> Why would you do that? It's not based on you. Listen, listen. Be strong in the Lord. In the, in the strength or power, I think King James probably says power. In the strength or power of his might. In other words, he, he's got more. He's going to give you just enough to get you out of the mess and moving forward. But he's got a lot more. You understand? You say, well, wonder if he runs out of gas. Ain't no way. No way. So I gave you some other passages that would be worth looking at, like 1 Corinthians 16, 13, or 2 Timothy 1, 12 through 14. And here's a point that I think about this. Listen, th this war can't be fought in the flesh and win. This war cannot be fought. I don't care. I don't care what the war is. Listen, he puts a lot of, you know, as soon as you think you're really good at something, then he changes the whole mess on you. He hits you with something completely different. We call it being blindsided. You should never be blindsided. You know you're going to get hit. And when you try to battle back in the flesh, it's a losing game. You got to go to the Lord. Be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. I mean, that is the name of the game. Listen, this, this war cannot be, cannot be fought in the flesh and win. Only in the Lord, in the strength of his might, can it be won. So he puts it in the what tense? Present tense. Right? Perfect. It, now, what he does is he, he, he now is going to use four heiress, which is a point in time, divorce for time. Or when it's as well as when it's an imperative, it's a hut to command. It's a hut to command. I mean, it's a strong command. You know, a parent might say, okay, Johnny, I want you to clean up your room before you go play. Maybe I'm paying attention, maybe, to the mother who says, Johnny! And he goes, like, oh, she's serious. I'm going to go clean up my room. Now, it shouldn't take that, should it? A, a command should be a command when it, 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 it issued. Some parents, they dotle their kids rather than train them. Okay? So th they, they wind up doing that. They, they reach their end. You wait till your daddy gets home and all that kind of stuff. Okay? Then he walks through the door and he's, got a, he's been hit with a... Be, be strong in the Lord in the power. <laughs> All right, so that's the first thing. It's a present tense. That's very important to the warrior. The warrior's list must understand how he must personally fight this war. He puts it in the present tense. Every day you must be prepared. Then the warfare enemy. And he's going to tell you why you put on the armor. Put on the armor. The what kind of armor? The full armor. Now he's only going to mention four. First of all, he's going to tell you why. Put on the full armor of God so that why? Purpose. So that you will be able to stand firm. So that's your part. If you'll stand. If you'll stand your ground in the Lord, if you'll stand your ground, and what? Be strong in the Lord, right? Yeah, in the strength of his might. That's what he means here. Stand. Stand firm. He's going to say that. He's going to use this word three times, so pay attention to it. Not, not in this passage, but in this text. Put on the full armor so that you will be able it's not going to come from inside you. It's going to come from a divine system, not a human system. It's going to come from a divine system. 
Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand. Now watch the word against. Against the schemes of the devil in verse 11. For our struggle, notice ours. That's everybody in this room. For our struggle, church, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. I want you to stop there a moment with me, but come back. I want you to slide back here to 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. And I want you to look at verses 3, 4, and 5 with me. This warfare is not about, fle is not about flesh and blood. It's not, it's not in the human realm. It's not in the visible human realm. It's the invisible realm. It's another dimension. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. There's your angelic conflict. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Be strong in the Lord in the, in the power of his strength or in the strength of his might. That's, that passage goes with this. Our struggle, this war, listen, if, if, you're, if you think this warfare is inside your marriage or inside your family or inside your church and this thing is fighting this way, that's not the angelic conflict. That's flesh and blood. That's carnality. That's not angelic conflict. That's, that's not con that, it's conflict, but it's not angelic conflict. That's carnality. You do know that, don't you? Gee whiz, people. That's carnality. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Then watch what he, this is what it's not, but here's what it is. It against rulers, powers, world forces of darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. That is Satan's entire military system of warfare. Okay? And it tells us, verse 11 and 12, notice that's an heiress tense, tells us it can't be fought without proper spiritual equipment and training to win. You've got to know who you're fighting and why the equipment you have is necessary to beat them. Four of this, four, actually five of these pieces of equipment is to keep you stable, standing strong, so that you can attack the enemy with a sword. Five of them is just to keep you to stand firm while, it, while you're being hit. Boom, 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 boom. So that at the, at the right time, God can say, draw and hit, and you hit him with a sword. Okay? You hit him with the word of God. How are you going to stand firm? Because you're fully equipped to stand firm by the attack of the enemy. And you're going to be attacked from all different levels and ways by rulers, by powers, by forces of darkness, by spiritual forces of weakness. One day I'll come back and I'll lay that out for you. But it shows you that you're going to be hit. You can be hit by rulers or by powers or by world force. You understand? There is, it's not just one way. You're going to be hit by a whole lot of different ways, by a whole lot of different things, but you're fully equipped to stand firm as all the hit, wait till it's done, and then get them. So this, this can't be fought without proper spiritual equipment and training to win. You got you to understand a little bit about the enemy, and no matter what he throws, you're fully equipped to, ha to handle the defense of it, right? Stand firm, be strong in the Lord, find the strength of his might, and when he throws everything he's got and he gets that, takes a deep breath, you, you stick him. All right? Because he's going to want out. You know, a lot of good boxers back in my day, what they would do, they'd take a lot of hits. And the guy would get all, all tired in about the fifth round. They'd let him pound him a while in the fifth round. And then the sixth round, he'd come out and just deck him. I don't know that they fight that way anymore, but back with Joe Lewis and all these guys, that's the, way, that's the way these guys fought. They, they fought you out to the fifth or sixth, seventh round whenever they felt they, they had worn you down. And 
Then they let you pound one round, and then they decked you. Anyhow, so that's kind of the point here. Uh, war mentality is in verse 13. Therefore, you see that word therefore? It, it, it's connected with everything in verse 11 and 12. I said, I said 12 because I wanted you, but everything in 11 and 12. It's, it's, and actually, this word in the Greek language is not the typical therefore. It's because of this. It actually says in the Greek language because of this. Is dia toto. Because of this. W because of the warfare. Look, you're going to have to have this equipment because the devil has, he can hit you from all different sides. I mean, he's, he has run intelligence on you. Right? He's run it on you. He, under, he, he went before him. He said, hey, I've run intelligence on Job. You, it, it ain't, nah. Forget Job. Give me somebody. Give me somebody easy. <laughs> I know Job. He runs intelligence on you. I mean, and he's going to hit you. He's going to hit you in all your vulnerable areas, and he's got more. I and mean, he tries to get you cheap and easy. And if you just understand your equipment is to take, the, take everything he's got, and when he gets back to take a deep breath, you can stick him. You can beat him. It's telling you the way it is. Therefore, because of verse 11 and 12, understanding the enemy and the equipment, therefore, take up, here it is again, the full armor. Twice he has said this under command. Take up the full armor of God with a divine purpose so that you will be able, he's come back to that same idea again, so that you will be able to resist. Notice the word is antihistamy when he says against. It's, see, that's the idea. Able to resist. Able to, you will be able to resist. What he's trying to do, listen to me, see that's anti-stand, that's his to me. What he's trying to do is knock you back, try to knock you off your feet. What he's trying to do is get you off balance. What he's trying to do is get you from not standing firm. If he finds you wishy-washy, Eve, he's going to knock you over. He finds you wishy-washy on the word of God, right? That's how we got Eve. She was wishy-washy on the word of God. He runs reconnaissance on you. You say, ah, probably not me, Ron, just you. Huh. Forget that idea. Like, he would like to wipe out everybody so that I wouldn't have a ministry. I'm not the only guy. I'm just part of the church. He's after the church. Let me tell you, he's as much after you as he is me because we're sitting here studying and getting it. We're a bigger threat tonight than we were yesterday when we get through this lesson. Uh, he, he hates this. Can I tell you he hates this? He hates this because he's a wimp. He's got no teeth. He's just a roaring lion without teeth. Somebody that is so scared will die in his presence. Otherwise, he could just gum you. There's nothing. There's nothing. He's, he's a coward. He's a coward. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist, which means to stand firm because it's an anti-resist, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day when he's hit you with, he's going to hit you with something easy, then he's going to come back and hit you again. He's going to hit you, and if he has to bring it all out, he'll bring it all out if he thinks that's a big a deal. Listen, it's not how important you are in the kingdom. He's after everybody the same way. When he gets a prey, he hunts that prey down until he gets them. And the only way he can get you is you surrender. He can't get you unless you surrender. And there are a lot of ways to surrender. 
the worst is mentally. Listen, in the evil day, I haven't done everything to stand. See, look at the word stand. Now look back at the word resist. See the anti in front of it? See, it's A-A-N-T, which is A-N-T-I. See, he's anti-stand firm. So all he's trying to do is get you not to stand firm. How, and how are you going to stand firm? Tell me how you're going to stand firm. Come on now. Be strong. Where I, look now, that's not how you're going to be strong. Be strong in the Lord, in the strength of his might. Right? Right? That's how we're going to be there. That's how we're going to do that. Stand. You stand firm. Now, you're going to hit with everything. And he's going to throw everything he can throw at you while you stand firm. Because he, he can't. He's anti-stand firm. Do you see that? Oh, oh that's so good. It's so good. What he what and he goes he's gonna throw the kitchen sink at you. Wait, because you don't have no offense if you don't. You have no offense. You could listen, and well, here we go. Weapons for fighting. Stand firm. Air is tense. Stand firm. Therefore. Now we got a regular therefore. What's that refer back to? Verse 13. Back to stand firm because he's trying to what? Get, he's he's anti-stand firm, right? His whole purpose of the warfare is knock you off your feet. All right, so to speak. So here is therefore. Now therefore refers to back 13. Stand firm therefore because that's how he closed 13, uh, 12 out, 13 out, right? So stand firm. And then he gives you four pieces of weapon. This is defense. He gives you truth. He gives you um, righteousness. He gives you the gospel of peace. Isn't that interesting? It's not called the gospel of war, although you're in it. Let me tell you what the devil is frightened of. When he sees these defensive weapons, truth. Truth keeps you, keeps you standing firm. Truth. Okay? He's a, listen, you know why? Because he's a what? <laughs> well, that's Ron Adema, that that's not the Bible. <laughs> I know, he is a wimp. I don't know that he's threatened by that when I say that. But I forgot, what, what, what was I saying? What did I say? Oh, yeah, right. Well, look, well, truth, well, but what, what is he, what's the opposite of truth that he's known as? He's a liar. Liar, liar, pants on fire guy. He's a liar. And listen, what's the second thing? Righteousness. Listen, he'd love to keep you in works all your life. The only way you get righteousness is through grace. That's the only way you get it in the new covenant. It's the only way you get it. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves, the gift of God. There is none apart from grace. This is the name of the game. Oh, how he hates it. Listen, if he could just get you off on some kind of work level. Oh, listen, he's, he, you're not standing. Because listen, truth, not lies. Righteousness, right? Not unrighteousness. Listen, that, he's, he's not worried about unrighteousness. He's worried about the substitute for righteousness, which is law. The gospel of what? Peace. Oh, he'd love the gospel of war. But listen, it's in Romans 5.1. Right? Romans 5.1. He's talking about the peace of God that comes. Right? He's talking about the peace, the peace with God. The peace with God. Oh, boy, how he hates the gospel. That Listen, the gospel is what snatches him right out of his domain, right? The gospel, oh, how he hates the gospel because the gospel is the only power that reach down into the domain of darkness and deliver and transfer, rescue and transfer them out into the Colossians 1, 13, 14. Oh, how he hates the gospel of peace. Oh, how he hates that. And then faith, the shield of faith, which is the faith cycle. 
Uh, the face, the shield. You don't wear it, you carry it, right? You, c you carry it out there. You carry it out there. And uh, oh, how he hates that. He hates the shield of faith. The faith. Faith. Oh, how he hates truth. He hates righteousness. He hates the gospel. He hates the faith cycle. Oh, listen. The shield of faith, which will be able, the shield of faith, which will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Maybe your Bible says missiles. Of the evil one. You know who the evil one is? Now we've had two things. We've had be aware of the evil day. That's when you're hitting the angelic conflict from all sides. And who's promoting that deal? The evil one. So, at least for Ron Adama, this word stand firm is a big deal. Right? Because what's he trying to do? He's trying to not get you stand firm in the Lord. Fully, fully armored and equipped. And listen, he knows he can't, listen, he, there's not one person in here that, that he can get them out of their salvation or going to, we saw that positional truth. If you're in one, you've got three. If you're saved by grace through faith, you go to heaven. It's not based on how you live. It's not based on how you live. It's how you got saved. Positional sanctification. I told you last night, this is a big doctrine. Bigger than you think it is. Oh, yeah, I've heard the doctrine. Of, oh, I can't begin to tell you how many people have never heard it. It's a key doctrine of the new covenant. In Christ. Think how many times. You hunt that down. Study your Bible in the New Testament. See how many times that's mentioned after the Gospels. It will overwhelm you. <laughs> well, yeah. we talked about it last night. Stand firm is used three times with the full armor and the words, you will be able. Listen, and I put them back on you because it's well worth your read again on your own. You need to read verse 12 again, 11 and 12. That would be 11 and 12, 13, 14 through 16, the way they're, the way they're listed. Stand firm is used three because it's a big deal. Stand full, full armor, and you will be able. Those are all keys to this passage. The warrior is now prepared to go to war. The warrior is now trained and prepared to go to war. So we have verse 17. Take. This word take is an interesting word. It can mean take. It can mean receive or accept. In the aorist imperative, it means to take hold of something. Take hold of the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. There's still one great vulnerable part of your life. And he saves it to last. He doesn't let you put your helmet on first. Now, he went by protocol, went by Roman emperor protocol. But listen, he fit his theology to it. And the last thing they did was put the helmet on. Because that was, that, hey, look, go back to weapons for fighting moment. I forgot to tell you. In this thing of stand firm, retreat is not an option. It's not an option, right? It's not an option. You can't cut and run. Listen to me. When you study all this armor, there was no protection for you back. If you cut and run, they got you. There's nothing for you back, buddy. But there is, if you stand firm, right? You got and run. That's not an option. All right. Take hold of the helmet of salvation. That's that's how important is that? Well, that's 
you know, get hit in the head while that's... <laughs> It's a pretty tough thing to overcome. So your helmet of salvation, what is that? The importance of the security of your salvation. No matter how this war comes out, it's okay because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remain strong in the Lord and the strength of his power. I don't care how this thing comes out. I don't care how it comes out because I'm better off winning or winning <laughs> because I got a win-win. I'm going to go out and I'm going to fight. If it's the Lord will, I die in combat, so be it, because that's a win-win for me. I'm not going to retreat. I'm not going to surrender. I'm going to fight. And I love to see it in people like you. Look at what you throw at me. You can't scare me. I'm going to stand firm, and I don't care, because everybody's going to die unless Christ comes back. Everybody's going to die. I'm going to die with my boots on. I'm going to die with my boots on. And Tony, we may not be able to stand like we did in the old days and give that great salute as a young soldier. We can still do it because it's inside that makes that work. You got that right. Hoo -ah. So you take the helmet of salvation, the security of your salvation, no matter how this no matter how this plays out, it's a win-win. You understand that? You're going to win-win. It's a win-win all the way around. Don told me last night, he said this with his mother, this has been a tough situation for his, with his mom. And, and boy, listen, he has no idea how. I, I was A guy stopped by the office the other day, uh, came into Chick-fil-A, and he Came back there and he said, Ron Ademeyer. And I went, well, yeah. I know who I am. Uh, and listen to how far he go. This guy went back with me. He said, I used to meet with you when you met at Burger King in Roebuck. Burger King. That's before Chick-fil-A was built. That's when we were meeting in Woodlong. And I lived a block from here. Went to Roebuck Park. Met with that kid. And, and now he's a grown man. Just Oh, jeez. And just retired. <laughs> <laughs> and what a wonderful little visit that was with him. And he wanted to know what was all going on. And I, of course, we just had a nice little visit. And I... Uh, he said, I can't believe you're still doing what you're doing. And I went, you must not know me very well. Oh, yeah, I know you very well, but age catches up with everybody. Well, age has, but not the end. Yeah, age has caught up with me. I can't, I can't, can't deny that. Quit. Just going to quit. Somebody said to me the other day, I hear you're leaving the church. And I went, no. They said, well, you're resigning or, 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 or retiring. I went, really? You must have talked to somebody that I what are you talking about. None of that's true. None of that's true. I could do either one of those things. Listen, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. There's one offensive weapon, two final weapons. The, one, the last one is to put on is don't let anybody rock your world about your salvation. Boy, if he, listen, the last, the last hooray is to try to hit you in the head. Try to shoot over that whatever. Now, let me, let me close with this because I'm, I'm going to leave this in your hands. That's point number two. Because you can see this illustrated in the Old Covenant with the war between David and Goliath. Sometimes what's missing is not understanding how this battle started out here. When you read this, you're going to find that on this mountain was Israel. And on this mountain were the Philistines. 
And down here is a valley. Now, that's important because every day Goliath would come out over here when the sun was shining really good, and he would come out, and he was nine feet tall, and the armor he's had, it would take five men to carry. His helmet weighed 125 pounds. His helmet. And he would come out decked in full armor, bronze. When the sun would hit him, the sun would reflect off to him and make him a lot taller than he looked. Now, he was nine feet tall. But when the sun got through with him, he was probably 13 or 14. And he would come out and his, the tallest man in the Philistine army would come out and care how, we don't know how tall he was, but he had to be pretty tall because he carried a nine foot man's shield. Many perceive, many think that was one of his brothers because he had five brothers. David picked up five stones and just in case there was more wanted some of what he had. And so they think maybe, historians think, it'd take a pretty big, tall guy to carry that, uh, and a pretty strong guy. Okay. Well, he comes out every day, and he looks bigger than the whole wide world because you got five foot, you got the average age over, uh, height over here is five. A tall guy would be six in Israel. And this guy comes out and looks like he's, 14 feet tall, and his bearer of his shield has got to be a giant himself. And they represent the Philistine army. And so every day he would come out, and, and he would challenge them. He would challenge their God. He would curse them in the name of his gods. He would come out, and he would defy them, and he would curse them, and he would challenge them every day in that sunlight. And he would challenge them, let's do a one-on-one, -on -one, winner takes all. We'll do a one-on-one, -on -one, you bunch of cowards. We'll do a one-on-one, -on -one, and the winner takes all. And so he would come out, the Israelites would come out, and they'd take a look, and they would go, oh, 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 and they would, they would retreat. <laughs> and Saul would say, let's go. And they would go like, home? We'll go home, but we're not crossing that. We're not going down that mountain. And so that was a mess. And so it went on and went on. So here comes a little guy out of Bethlehem. He comes, out, a little shepherd guy. His dad wants him to go out and check out his brothers who are at war. Well, actually, they're camped on the front lines. And sends him out with, a, with some food from home and to get a word because we didn't have 6 o'clock news. So we sent him out to, get a, to give him news back there. So he comes out, what's going on? So he watches Goliath come out one day. And he's there watching this whole thing. Not a whole lot to watch except Goliath. Goliath was the show. So he waited around to see what's happening. Well, well, he said, well, you wait tomorrow. When the sun is up high, Goliath will be out. So he said, I think I'll stay. So he stayed around an extra day and watched Goliath come out. And he went, whoa, that's a big dude. That's a big dude. Who wouldn't want him as a basketball player? That's a big dude. And so he watches him and listens to him, and he just it infuriates him to listen to him blaspheme God and God's people. It infuriates him. So he watches this. He stays over a couple other days. His brothers think he ought to get out of there and go back home. He has no business there. You remember that? You have no business here. You're, you're uh, well, he says, you know, he finally gets to King. He, he says, why won't anybody go find him? He goes to his brothers. Come on, guys, get out there and whip that guy. They go like, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Have you seen that guy? He's 14 feet tall. I don't go over there. No. And so th nobody will fight him. David goes around the camp, talks to people. Nobody wants to fight him. No, only a fool would fight him. That's not a fair fight. We're nobody. Going, okay, well, let's just attack the whole group and get it. Okay, if you don't want to fight one, I mean, a one-on-one -on -one and the whole thing would be over sounds pretty good. 
If not, well, let's go to war. Well, he's causing enough fuss that they bring him before King Saul. They bring him before King Saul. And King Saul says, look, look, you're causing a fuss around here, boy. Why don't you, you need to go home or what, what's going on? Well, he says, I hate this whole deal. This guy comes out. Let's shut his mouth. Not one more day should we put up with him uh, speaking badly about God. Let's shut him down. <laughs> you don't understand, son. Well, I understand. There's not one soldier in this army. Mm -mm. Well, I'll do it. No. Okay. Oh, you're a shepherd boy. You don't know anything about warfare. Have you ever fought in that? Well, by the way, I have. You, you have fought in a war? Well, sort of. Well, what did you do? Well, one day I was shepherd and a lion came out. I grabbed him, threw him down, and put him out. I messed with my sheep. This the Lord put me out there. Custodian of the Lord. Well, that's probably an accident. I mean, you had a little luck on your side. Luck, nothing. Well, wh wh anything else on your resume? Yeah! A bear came out one day and tried to snatch one of them. I started to put him down. Wow. Hmm. I will go out there and get him. All right, well, here's the equipment you got to have. So he quips him up and he goes like, I can't do this. This is not, I don't need all this. Well, what are you going to go out and fight him with? Well, I got my shepherd clothes on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you represent a shepherd, not the military of Israel. I know. Listen, I represent the Lord. And my armor that I have, you cannot see. But the only way I beat a lion and a bear was by the Lord. The Lord delivered me every time. And they only threatened the sheep. This man threatens the whole nation. He threatens God Almighty. And he needs to be shut up. So the king says, okay. Let's do a one-on-one. -on -one. Send Goliath out. We're going to send a soldier, sort of, kind of. And out comes this little skinny Jewish boy, teenager. He's got his shepherd clothes on. He has a sling with a little bag. And on the way, he picks up five little smooth stones. And everybody is gathered on both sides, have gathered on both sides of the mountain. We're finally going to have some war. One on one, winner takes all. You can hear this. Da, 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 da. Everybody's partying over here, and everybody over here is whining and crying. <laughs> and probably the lead chorus were the brothers. And down the hill comes this little guy. And down comes the hill of this big guy with his guy carrying his shield. And when he gets about, David gets about here, he begins to run and he keeps walking. David gets to run and runs over here and hits him with one stone, one sling, one stone, and one God Almighty and puts him down. You know what all the you know what the entire army of the Philistines did? They ran like crazy. And when they began to run, down came the army of Israel for victory. You know how he did it? He did it, listen, because he understood the armor, he understood the stand firm, and he understood the offensive weapon. Who delivered David? Who delivered Goliath in your hands? You know what he'd tell you? The same one who delivered the bear, the lion and the bear, my God. And so he leaves us with a message. The message that David has, the battle is always the Lord's. That was his, he put him on little coins and gave them out. No, I don't know. 
It's a wonderful story. It's well worth a read. I mean a different read. One that takes in Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. Let us pray. Father, we're so thankful for these who have come our way again tonight. Oh, I know, Father. It's the middle of the week. They've been busy. I mean, they have been working. They've got stuff, and yet, in your marvelous grace, you've put the need in their life to come for whatever reason. And I pray, Father, it's been well worth every minute of their time as the Holy Spirit has taught them great, wonderful truths. Always winning every battle is the Lord's, and therefore the victory is ours. The win. Oh, gosh. Father, we're so thankful for this study, for these people, and for those on the Internet that have dropped in. Stay with us. Go back and, and pick up our study on Wednesday night in the angelic conflict and, and get current with us and go forward with us in this study. This will revolutionize your life wherever you live and cause you to be a victor and not a victim in the angelic conflict. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.